Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series. It's great to see you again, and thank you for coming again in such large numbers. Tonight, we are online again, as you can see. Normally, we are live, but during this semester, we unfortunately still need to be online because of the coronavirus. Hopefully, in the near future, that will change again. I'm Klaus Laras. I'm the Richland Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. The Crusto Global Event Series features leading experts from the world of academia, diplomacy, the military, journalism, the media, and many other areas. And we always talk about issues of global concern. Let me just mention again our wonderful website, that is krasnoevents.com. Here you can find a form to fill in to be put on our mailing list. But you can also just send me an email and I will add you to the mailing list. And behind me, you can see my personal email address, but you can also see the address of the website and you can see the address of our YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel is, of course, very popular, very famous. We videotape all our events and upload them to our YouTube channel. Our last event on the global race for vaccine has already been uploaded. Please be so kind and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, watch our events and videos as often as you can. They're all great. Tonight, we are dealing with empires and why, and why some last so long, more than 2,000 years, such as the Roman Empire, and why some do not last quite as long. We have three wonderful speakers tonight who all have a great sense of humor, and they are all outstanding and very well-published scholars of the history and politics of the Roman Empire. I would like to welcome Professor Mary Boatwright of Duke University, the other university here in the vicinity, just down the road. And a hearty welcome, of course, also to Professor John Landon of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And of course, to Professor Richard Talbot here of UNC Chapel Hill. I would also like to mention our two great Krasno assistants tonight, that is Brittany Broom and Pete Villasmil. Brittany is actually responsible for uploading the videos to our YouTube channel, and she's doing a great and very efficient job. Thank you for this. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our event on empires then and now. Why did the Roman Empire last so long? Each speaker will talk for some 12 to 15 minutes. I will then pose a few questions to each of our speakers and try to find out more about their, their, their insights. And then, as always, we will open it up to questions from you, the audience. We would like you to submit your questions to our panelists by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our two formidable Krasno assistants, Brittany and Pete, will select the most interesting questions and read them out aloud. Thus, please don't uh, be shy. Please submit your questions. Can I also ask you to mention your name and your affiliation if you, have some, uh, if you have one and perhaps your location, your city or country. And please ask short and succinct questions. This would be great. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome our panelists tonight on Empires Then and Now. Our first speaker will be Professor Richard Talbot. Richard Talbot retired this summer as Keenan Professor of History at UNC Chapel Hill. A little while back, he produced a major study of Roman government, the Senate of Imperial Rome. More recently, his main interest has been rethinking many Roman ideas of time and space. He edited the definitive Barrington Atlas, which spans the ancient world from Britain to India, and he has published books about the, uh, the Roman uh, uh, Putinger map, as well as about Roman portable sundials. He enjoys collaborating with Professor Mary Boatwright on college level textbooks for Roman history. And they, these textbooks have, been all, have all been used widely. But Richard actually is not properly retired. He remains in charge of the Ancient World Mapping Center here at UNC, and he founded that mapping center some 20 years ago. Tonight, Richard will talk to us about the High Roman Empire, um, and he is wondering um, hold on. He is wondering whether the Roman Empire, the High Roman Empire, was the happiest and most prosperous period for the human race. Over, mm. over to you, uh, Richard. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you for having us and for organizing this. Sure. Well, I'm going to take this at quite a clip because there's a fair bit to say, but as you'll see, it raises lots of questions. Consideration of why the Roman Empire lasted so long should begin with an outline of how it came into being. 
which can help explain why it lasted. The site of Rome in the Latium region near the west coast of the Italian peninsula first saw the growth of village settlements there from maybe around 1200 BCE. During the 600s, the villages somehow merged into a city. No, don't put that on yet, Pete. No, no, we don't want that yet. Uh, uh, somehow uh, they merged into a city which was called Roma, which somehow came to be ruled by one man with lifetime authority, a king. Around 500, however, a revolution abolished the monarchy and instituted a republic. Now all authority was shared between office holders who had to be elected in a citizen assembly and whose term of office was normally just one year. There was an influential council of leading citizens, the Senate, which advised the two joint heads of state, the consuls. But there was also involvement by the whole citizen body because, as I've just said, and subject to various restrictions, the citizens elected everybody in authority and no law could be made without a citizen assembly's approval. Romans recognized that their city was one of merely regional importance, as well as vulnerable in the strife which was endemic throughout the Italian peninsula's many different communities, none of them a dominant power. In this scary predicament, Romans saw that they must always be aware of unfriendly, untrustworthy neighbors. The best protection, they reasoned, was a sturdy, motivated army recruited from their own men, and the bigger it could be, the better. Men of substance in this world were holders of land, which naturally they had no intention of giving up. So, Romans reasoned, the more land they could occupy, the more potential soldiers could be settled on it, and they're drafted to serve when an army was needed. The more Rome's territory expanded, the safer and stronger the Roman Republic could be. In the struggle to boost their manpower, Romans weren't picky. Men ready to be loyal, to be drafted, and to learn the regional language, Latin, were welcome. If an entire community, which Rome thought needed subduing, opted instead for becoming an ally and contributing its men to the Roman army when called on, that was fine. Rome asked for nothing more than the men and gladly permitted that community to keep on running its own affairs just so long as it stayed loyal and now left external relations to Rome. For Rome, this was a winning formula, infinitely expandable with snowball effect. The more communities in the peninsula that signed up for it, the stronger Rome's hold on Italy became. Until, by about 270, all had become Rome's allies. Yeah, true, plenty of them only after bitter conflict following which Rome confiscated some of their land and founded new cities or colonies of Roman citizens settled there as gloating watchdogs. Gradually, Rome grasped the value of its citizenship as a supreme reward to encourage allies' loyal service. An easy privilege to bestow, and unlikely to upset Rome's politics because citizens could only exercise their right to vote when in Rome itself. Now let's have that map, Pete. Rome's domination of all Italy became a trigger that provoked rivalry with Carthage, a major power in North Africa, not so far away across the Mediterranean. Two bruising long wars that Carthage lost embroiled Rome first in Spain, then in Greece and Western Turkey, gradually acquiring territory that Romans didn't really want, but also didn't dare just to abandon in case enemies then regained it. So Rome replicated what had worked in Italy, offer local elites autonomy in exchange for loyalty, and require, in this case rather than manpower, tax payments in cash or kind, for example, grain. 
A senator was appointed overseer or governor in each region or province kept hold of. But his term of office was again just the standard one year, and his level of intervention in the various local communities could only be minimal. But that was fine by Romans, because these regions outside Italy and their peoples were mostly looked down on as pesky, conquered subjects not worth much bother. In time, predictably, the growing number of territories haphazardly acquired came to be considered an empire. Let's have the next map and you'll see progress by 70 BC. Such growth made neighboring states hostile. In the east especially, in particular a king Mithridates in eastern Turkey. The Republic's standard rules and term limits for office holding proved inadequate for crushing him. So the senator, Pompey, who finally overcame him, smashed the curbs on competition between leading citizens, which were already under pressure. He also hugely enriched himself and his men from the wealth of Mithridates' kingdom and other extensive conquests in the east, down into Syria and across to the river Euphrates. Pompey's example fired up Julius Caesar, who was six years younger, to outdo him. Let's have the third map. Hence Caesar's reckless, unauthorized efforts to annex Gaul for Rome, committing genocide in, for the purpose, and his passion to become top Roman in the Republic by whatever means it took. So here was a headlong personal attack on the collegiality vital to the Republic's functioning. Even a civil war couldn't halt this attack because Caesar won and soon maneuvered the Senate into upgrading his position to life dictator. But he miscalculated just how deeply this most unrepublican step outraged senators. It was why many assassinated him on the famous Ides of March 44. Yet they in turn were naive in imagining that authority would then revert again to the Senate. Instead, further rivals battled for power in more civil wars all across the Mediterranean, lasting as long as 14 years. The slaughter, damage, deprivation, lawlessness were horrific. The Roman state came close to self-destruction. Contrary to all expectation, however, a winner did emerge who again, surprisingly, was able to restore peace and stability and to devise an acceptable partnership between himself and the Senate. This winner was in fact Caesar's choice of heir, his grand nephew, Octavian, who in 27 took the new name Augustus to symbolize the new era of peace. He placated senators by shrewdly urging that all the institutions of the Republic be restored. And they pretty much were, with no special office or prominence for himself, the opposite of Caesar's approach. Rather, he would be content with the anodyne, informal designation, princeps, just leading figure. Actually, the Senate did vest him with supreme powers, but these were not tied to any office nor publicized. And Augustus insisted that he would not disturb the functioning of the restored Republic unless some serious threat arose like another Caesar. Quite an act on his part, the cynic in you may think. Agreed, but it worked. And it now gave Rome the strong, single, long-term leader figure which during the Republic there had deliberately never been. One of Augustus's major initiatives was to reform Rome's by now dysfunctional military into a professional, loyal, volunteer standing army that he stationed in key frontier zones. He also used it to expand Roman territory and to render this a cohesive world empire that Romans were now encouraged to take pride in as a civilizing mission. Let's have the next map. 
most notably, the, uh, uh, the army subdued all of Central and Eastern Europe up to the River Danube. Augustus also pressed for the conquest of Germany east of the Rhine, but that proved too much of a challenge. And so he settled for the Rhine, the Danube, and the Euphrates as the empire's limits, along with sea and desert. In the Mediterranean, Egypt had been the last major state not yet acquired by Rome. But Octavian took possession of it at the end of the civil wars. So the Mediterranean was now a Roman lake. Beyond, there was a major state to rival Rome's strength on only one frontier the Parthian, a formerly Persian empire to the east across the Euphrates. Augustus calculated uh, that this was best handled by firm diplomacy. Parthia was capable of serious aggression, but it was often unstable. And Augustus's gamble here paid off. During the next couple of centuries, Parthia seldom posed a threat. One of the two major additions to the empire by Augustus's successors, let's have the next map, the wealthy kingdom of Dacia, north of the Danube, probably had posed some threat, but the other, Britain, hardly did. However, for the emperor Claudius, who began this expansion, it was a priority to gain the glory traditionally associated with winning new territory. In short, for at least Two centuries after Augustus had made the empire larger and more robust, it benefited from what seemed minimal likelihood of serious external threats developing to disturb its stability within. Ironically, this stability was most likely to be upset by the army, or part of it, backing a rival claimant for the position of princeps, which Augustus had wanted to be a matter of hereditary succession. But of course, when the succession presented a problem, the kind of strife which had wrecked the Republic might well recur. And in the next two centuries, it did once in the aftermath of Nero's suicide. Fortunately, a claimant able to restore stability gained control after only a year of warfare. And there was no other such regression, although the fearful prospect often loomed. Internal risings by the civilian population were a remoter prospect. Certainly a few were attempted by peoples with a strong sense of group identity, the Jews being the best known. But such peoples were very much the exception and no match for the army. Most tribal groupings were small and most cities maintained a local pride which regarded their neighbors as rivals, not as friends. As to the large provinces into which Rome had divided its territories for administrative convenience, few possessed a group identity and nothing was done to foster one. Because Augustus was so concerned to placate senators, he left it that as in the Republic, they alone should be governors of provinces and they should do the job as they always had, with a skeleton staff and minimal opportunity for intervention in local affairs. Each community's elite remained in charge on the ground. Stability was reinforced by a mix of factors which made Roman rule widely acceptable at all levels. At the top, the princeps demonstrated that he genuinely cared for people's welfare, and he treated loyal provincials with respect, even awarding Roman citizenship to many. There was constant investment in infrastructure empire-wide, construction of roads and harbours especially. Yeah, primarily, no doubt, to move troops when needed, but these facilities were available free of charge for everybody, and Rome imposed no restrictions on anyone's movement. The princeps projected himself as an approachable ruler, ready to help individuals or communities, however insignificant, who made him aware of their special difficulties. Many did, in person or by letter, and many were helped. At a high level, there was even the right to prosecute a provincial governor once he'd left office for alleged corruption or cruelty. True, there had already been this resource in the Republic, but it was probably a more effective deterrent to lax governing now, with the trials becoming high-profile occasions in the Senate and the emperor kept in form. Every thankful for the peace that Augustus brought after so much civil war, 
and for the chance to rebuild their lives and prosper. And for Roman citizens, no more draft. No wonder many people revered Augustus as a living god. Now, just to finish, please understand, I am not, not, not making the naive claim that the empire lasted so long because it became utopia. Of course, life is never pure sunshine. All empires are exploitative and cause for resentment. And Rome's was created by endless bloodshed. But at this time and place, given people's low expectations, both for their own prospects and for the ruling power to care about them, which it had barely even tried to do during the Republic, I think we can appreciate how the empire as Augustus left it continued widely acceptable, especially while it had the good fortune to stay peaceful and unthreatened. Thank you very much, Richard. You gave us a very good overview. Thanks a lot. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk um, that many of the Republican institutions kept staying, kept working into the empire. So did people on the ground, Roman citizens and the others, did they actually realize they had gone from a republic to an empire or was that a much later development? <laughs> Well, no, the, 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 uh, the propaganda was that the Republic was still there, it was alive and well. Yeah, I mean, how much people swallowed that, of course, is, is dubious. I think one thing they obviously would have realized, and that is that for, for ordinary citizens, the political element, the voting element, had pretty much fallen away. And that was inevitable, given the uh, expansion in area of the Roman community and the sheer number of citizens. And of course, for that, what never changed was the rule that you could only vote in person in Rome itself. And therefore, of course, increasingly, the number of people who could turn up to vote was uh, less and less representative of the citizen population as a whole. So yeah, I think to that extent, yes, people were aware that the Republic uh, was no longer what it once had been, but I don't think that most people, frankly, I don't think most people cared. I think what mattered to them much more was peace, stability, the rule of law, uh, uh, those sorts of things. And, and for us, okay, this is all very basic and we may not like some of this very much, but I think it, it came down to these basics and I think they much preferred uh, life uh, under the empire than it had been for many of them earlier. And as I say again, of course, for citizens, no draft. Uh, and the, the number of men uh, for much of the Republic serving in the army and the casualty levels were, uh, were huge. Right, thanks very much. I think we'll probably develop that topic a little uh, further later on. But let's come to our second speaker, that is Professor John Ted Landon. He is a professor of history at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He's the author of a number of acclaimed books, which either deal with the Roman government or deal with ancient warfare. And as we know, government and warfare have a lot in common anyway. Ted's books are entitled Empire of Honor, The Art of the Government in the Roman World, and Soldiers and Ghosts, A History of Battle in Classical Antiquity, and Song of Wrath, The Peloponnesian War Begins. Tonight, Professor Landon will talk about a topic which we are all familiar with, and that is doom and gloom. His remarks are entitled Gloom and Doom in the Third and Fourth Centuries ID. Over to you, Professor Landon. You're muted. No, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Let me see if I can do that for you. You now. Okay, I am okay. unmuted. I am unmuted. <clears throat> Here I was um, amused at everyone else's technical difficulties and I immediately wander into my own, which is entirely, uh, entirely suitable and entirely deserved. Um, my job is to continue what Richard was talking about, but into a bad period. And I want to talk about 
the third and fourth centuries AD, uh, at the end of which period uh, the Roman Empire in the West at least had essentially ceased to exist. Now, I am always immensely impressed, of course, by uh, Richard Talbert's maps. Uh, there is nothing more, more, uh, more astounding in the world than a view of Richard Talbert's famous maps. But I wa don't want you to think of those maps. I simply want you to think of the Roman Empire as a, um, as a rectangle, like that. Or maybe just looking much like my bow tie. Um, and if you, if you think that way, um, you can re immediately realize that it has uh, de just considerable defensive problems, but also considerable defensive advantages. On the West Coast, you have the Atlantic Ocean, and nothing much can happen on the West Coast because you have the Atlantic Ocean. You are protected there. The Southern Coast was basically the Sahara Desert. There were raiders who lurked down there, but they could be dealt with, with relatively, e re relatively easily. The East boundary, the lower half of it was essentially desert and there was not too much problem, but the upper 400 miles of it was a border, the border with the, uh, who we've, uh, with the Parthians, who we've already heard about, who were an, an intermittently aggressive people uh, living to the East. The really dangerous part, however, was the uh, 1,400 miles which constitute the top of my bow tie from Hadrian's Wall in Britain down the Rhine and then through the Danube into the, uh, into the Black Sea. Um, the Romans, of course, had the advantage of defenses there, the two rivers and, and, their, um, uh, and their built defenses, but still that was a very, very great distance to be protected uh, and it had to be protected by an army which although was amazing by antique standards where standing armies are essentially unknown, nevertheless was never very large. We're talking about somewhere between 250 and 350,000 men attempting to protect an area or attempting to protect a line of some 1800 miles, uh, which, which if you do the math, suggests that you don't have a lot of men per mile uh, as you go up and down uh, the Rhine and the Danube and the Eastern Frontier and Hadrian's Wall. The Romans were long fortunate that they had, that the enemies over their borders were relatively sleepy or highly divided. The Parthians over the Eastern border were relatively sleepy and were happy to make treaties with the Romans, whilst the barbarians to the North, mostly the Germans of various shapes and sizes were divided into small tribes who the Romans could either defeat or set against each other. This starts to change in the 160s AD. And in the 160s AD, you get what are we call super tribes uh, of Germans, which are not anything new in the world. They are the old tribes of Germans, but gathered in larger groups and much more efficient, much more militarily dangerous. And these super tribes uh, begin to, uh, uh, to exert pressure on the Danube and then subsequently the Rhine frontier. So first um, you have uh, on the Danube, the Marcomanni, uh, a uh, the first of the super tribes. Then on the Rhine, you have the Alamanni, which, all, which means all the men. So you can tell that it was a considerable something or other. Um, in uh, the year 224, the, um, uh, the, the relatively sleepy uh, Parthian Empire to the east is overthrown by the much more aggressive Sasanian or Sassanid Empire, which is much more eager and much more interested in attacking Rome. And then finally, uh, from the 230s, you have the Goths who begin as a people at the top of the uh, Black Sea, sending down naval expeditions to hassle the Romans, but eventually end up on the Danube and are a considerable danger there. So um, the Romans had never been objectively strong. They'd simply been stronger than, than their opponents. And this is sort of a case of bad luck. 
uh, that all of these peoples become, uh, that the Romans, are the Romans are faced with, become fierce and dangerous more or less at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that the Romans have to do a lot mo much more fighting than they had to do in the past. And they have to raise larger armies uh, and they have to run around and desperately try to plug holes in their boundaries. Um, because Rome was a monarchy, as we heard from Richard, uh, there was also the problem that it was not regarded as possible for a general to command a, significant, uh, to command a very large force of men. And if a general was commanding a very large force of men or accumulated a very large force of men around him, those men tended to proclaim him emperor. Um, so that this, these problems within, without the empire, that is to say the pressure from these various groups outside the empire, produced in turn multiple emperors within the empire. I'm talking here about in the period of the third century AD. And once the, uh, once the foreign problem was dealt with, once the enemy was driven away, there was no political option possible except for um, civil war. And so we have foreign wars and we have civil wars. We have destruction of the economy. The Roman, the Roman state could not run a public debt. So when it didn't have enough money to pay its army, all it could do was debase the coinage. That is to say, take in whatever coinage there is and issue it again with less silver in it. Um, the result of this eventually was a collapse of the coinage in, in the 270s AD. So that the, uh, and, the, and, the, and with that, a considerable collapse of the economy. A bad period, in, uh, therefore, in general, probably, and of course, you could, every historian um, would disagree with me on this, and everyone has their own opinion, but probably created this bad period by the increase, by the bad fortune of the increase of external pressure, which caused internal civil war, which caused all sorts of internal chaos. This was situation was reversed, or at least Rome was given an Indian summer by two remarkable emperors by the names of Diocletian and Constantine. Diocletian reigning from 284 to 305 and Constantine reigning, reigning from 306 to 337, although um, that simplifies a, great, a certain amount of civil war and general uproar that occurs between them. Uh, but the basic fact is uh, these two guys uh, uh, succeed one another and they manage uh, through uh, uh, great military success to drive away the problems around the borders. That is to say, they defeat the pressure from the various, bo uh, from the various border peoples and make those border peoples either quiet or, com or committed to treaties or whatever. This, of course, makes the, the multiplication of emperors unnecessary. Um, and the result, therefore, is that the civil wars, which were so much a, a characteristic of the third century, become much rarer. I'm not saying there are no civil wars in the fourth century. There are plenty. But rather than having five emperors at a time all fighting each other, which is what you get in the, fourth century, in, in the third century, in the fourth century, you get fewer emperors um, and they're not, uh, and, and uh, they, they tend to have legitimate emperors who reign for a good long time, as if we were back in the happy days of the second century. Um, this is, however, a poorer world that everyone is, that these emperors are presiding over, simply because of the destruction of the previous, of, of the previous century. And as a result of this being a poorer world, to put together armies, the armies necessary to deal with external threats requires remarkable administrative reforms by Diocletian and Constantine, and specifically requires something that the Romans had never had, as Richard has already said, which is a systematic bureaucracy, a real government. Um, you can, there are any number of estimates out there for the increase in the size of Roman government, but the minimum is probably a multiplication in size of about six um, from a government consisting of about 5,000 people, which is of course astonishingly tiny by our standpoint, to a government consisting of 30,000 people. I suspect the actual government 
the, um, the number of government officials in the fourth century was considerably larger than that, um, something around 100,000, I would guess. At the same time, the government required, the, the army, of course, um, required pay. Um, and, the, um, uh, and because of the problems that had occurred in the third century, uh, it was desired and qu quite correctly that the army be considerably larger than the armor, army had been before. So um, a lot of money had gone to it, but the army also had other functions now than it had had previously collecting taxes. Um, it has to create its own armor and weapons and things of that nature. So what you have is a weaker economy with a lot more pressure on it. That is, by, by, by pressure, I mean a, a, a government which gobbles down money and an army which also gobbles down money, but which interestingly, when it actually goes to battle, turns out to have very few soldiers in it. Um, so that the notional number of soldiers, as I said, people estimate something up to 600,000, um, but the actual number of soldiers who show up for battle tends to be 15,000, 20,000, so things like that, much smaller than the Romans could put together in the late Republic or indeed in the period of the empire Richard was talking about. Not only small, but also fragile and irreplaceable. Uh, again, uh, this weak economy with all this pressure on it cannot produce and generate an, arm, uh, an excellent army you know, although the army is excellent, it cannot reproduce that army generation after generation. If there are major defeats, then the army cannot easily be um, put back together again. And there is, for example, a major defeat uh, in the year 380, uh, 378 at the Battle of Adrianople, where a large proportion of the existing army in the east is destroyed and the Romans, rather than coming up with a new army and driving the Goths away, um, are obliged to surrender a considerable amount of the empire to the Goths. And the situation becomes much worse by the early years of the next century, of the fifth century, when probably during an ice storm so that they could walk across, um, a variety of barbarian tribes simply wander into Gaul uh, in the last days of the year 406 and seem, so far as we can, we can tell, to meet no objections or no, um, uh, no obstruction whatsoever. There is simply, by this time, no Roman army to face them, uh, and the result is that they simply take over Gaul, eventually move into Spain, eventually move into North Africa, and the result is that the Roman Empire in the West is eventually reduced to nothing more than Italy, which hangs on for a considerable period, but then eventually even Italy is devoured by the barbarian kingdoms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. This was most interesting. Can I ask you, what actually was a Roman warfare like? Were civilians affected as much as today? And what, what would you say was the difference between modern, or is the difference between modern warfare and Roman warfare? Apart, of course, from the advancement in technology, I would say. Um, uh, civilians were very much effective, affected. The Romans were exceptionally brutal, um, and um, that was part of their policy to make sure that people did not um, rebel from them or, uh, or fight them. Uh, and um, so they, and of course, um, rather than having a system of, of, of taking prisoners, they had a system of taking slaves. Uh, uh, and so um, the Romans were not a people you wanted to come into your area if you could avoid it. Um, Richard's uh, uh, sunny view of the Roman Empire is something that starts, say, three generations after the Romans have actually shown up. Because when the actual when Romans show up, they kill everybody, um, they destroy everything, and there's even a, there's a famous depiction, I think it's in the author Polybius, of them even cutting the dogs in half when they capture a city. So modern warfare com uh, in comparison to that is actually, uh, you know, the Geneva Convention has had some effect. The yes, rules have much, uh, we, we at least attempt to be much less brutal than the Romans. Um, the, the Romans made brutality very much one of their strategic principles. 
Okay, thank you very much indeed. More on that, I'm sure, later on in the discussion. Let's come to our third and final speaker, and that is Professor Mary Tolly Boatwright. Uh, Tolly has just retired from the Department of Classical Studies at Duke University. She spent 41 happy years there, she told me, and among her many happy experiences were collaborating with Richard Talbot on a Roman history textbook and its various editions. Tolle's research centers on Roman imperial history, which she has approached in different ways. Above all, she has focused on writing Roman history from below, from the point of view of the people who lived under Roman rule, rather than from the point of view of the Roman elite itself. Her first book, Hadrian and the City of Rome, dealt with the center of Rome's imperial power. In her next book, she looked at Rome's indispensable provincial cities in a volume entitled Hadrian and the Crisis of the Roman Empire. After that, Tolly turned her sights to those marginalized in the empire's power structures. The resulting book was called The Peoples of the Roman World. Her forthcoming Imperial Women of Rome illuminates the Roman Empire by focusing on many fascinating individuals from Livia to Julia Mamea, who were all at the center of power, but always uh, a sidelined. Tonight, Mary Boatwright will talk to us about the Roman Empire and its family lives, shared values, common purpose, family and empire. Over to you, Mary. All right. And now we can go. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be involved in this. And uh, the perspective that I am taking is one that is uh, kind of, as you've already indicated, Klaus, is from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And um, so I wanted to start by recapitulating a couple of things that have already been said. That, uh, and that is to point out some of the givens about the Roman Empire at its heyday in the middle of the second century CE of the Common Era or AD. And here just to give some, some uh, numbers and they're not, every one of them is controversial, but one, it's usually agreed that the emperor ruled some 60 million people in the empire. Um, in the middle of the second century uh, CE. Five to six million of those people were in Italy, which had a favored status because it didn't have land tax for Roman citizens. About a million of those 60 million were in Rome itself, a mega city, a metropolis, if you ever wanted one. And all of it was ruled with only, it's been estimated again, just a little over 450,000 armed forces. And this goes to something to both to both Richard's and Ted's talks, kind of where were the, where were the armies? And one of the things that is rather um, striking about the Roman Empire is the puzzling paucity of notable revolts. Um, and here I've listed for you again on one of the maps that from um, uh, Richard's uh, Ancient World Mapping Center, I've, I've tried to indicate the greatest of these notable revolts, really the only ones that uh, commanded attention in our ancient sources. And I've listed them below. You can see the um, areas are keyed to the um, the, uh, the names of the revolts and their dates. And, you know, it certainly was horrific to be involved in any of those revolts, as we know particularly well from the first Jewish revolt from 66 to 70 or 73 CE, um, because of the works of Josephus, horrendous, gory, rabid, and terrible things on all sides but there just weren't that many for an empire of this, bit, of this size. And indeed, other than the Jewish revolts, most of these notable revolts were ones that happened fairly early in the so-called pacification of these areas. And that goes to something that Ted just brought out about how horrendous Roman takeover of an area was. So here I just wanted to point out again, kind of the miracle, if you will, of how the empire 
stayed together, how it cohered. There were very different cultures, very different languages. Uh, there were different histories of occupation. There were extremely deep socioeconomic divides within an agrarian economy. The whole of the empire really depended upon an agrarian economy and the economy was an extractive one. You wanted to get the taxes for Caesar. And uh, it's already been mentioned how steeply hierarchical the government was with the emperor at the top, how relatively few people were actually in the bureaucracy during the first couple of centuries of the empire. I've mentioned already the taxes for Caesar. Yes, there are Roman troops. And the fiction was, and really the reality until the times that um, Mr. Gloom and Doom spoke about, the reality was that the troops tended to be stationed on the borders. So they were not in the cities. There was also the law of Rome, one of the most remarkable achievements of Rome, which was used more and more, even by the end of the first century CE, by the provincial communities, even if they were not Roman citizens. We have town charters, it lets us see that. And in any case, by 212 CE, the law was passed, the Constitutio Antoniniana, as it's called, the law was passed that granted Roman citizenship to everyone, every free man in the Roman Empire, other than a, a small, some small exceptions. And then people always think about, well, what helped to the Roman Empire to um, cohere? One can think certainly of the Greco-Roman urban culture and of imperial cult. I will just say that of this area you see in this schematic map, Maybe there were at most about 2,000 cities that, that governed themselves and collected taxes and sent them up to Rome. It's not very much. And many of the people were out in the countryside and would come into the cities only for celebrations of festivals and the like. And one of those was imperial cult and that I'll come back to. So I thought, I've been thinking, you know, what helped the hearts and minds of the people within the empire. What, what is it? And um, I think it's really one way to think about it is to think about family. And here, I'm a good classicist. I have to have a nice ancient uh, source to go to. And we can see Cicero articulating in the end of the Republic, and then he was followed by Augustine in the um, fourth century. They consider that family to be the foundation of the state and of all human society. And further, they consider marriage to be the seedbed of a city. And here on your left, you see a very famous iconic piece, which is in Rome, and it shows a great Roman citizen, a member of the aristocracy in his, in his toga, carrying the bus of its ancestors. So hearkening back to his wonderful family from the past from whom he's gained glory. And on the right, you see a much more humble piece, which is also uh, exhibited in Rome. And it shows it's from the second century BCE before the common era. And it shows us a mother with her two children as she uh, goes forward. So here we're looking at um, the posterity, not the ancestors. Family was all important. We've already heard from both of my uh, co-speakers the importance of manpower. It's absolutely, absolutely key for the Roman uh, army and for the Roman state. But it's, it's important for so many other ways, other reasons. And here I show us a um, funerary relief, which is in the Museum of North Carolina Museum of Art. I wanted to give a shout out for the North Carolinians. And it shows us three freed people, Malleus, his wife, Ficinia, and a son, Malleus, as they see, and, and they are now all, or the men at least, are Roman citizens in their togas. But to go back to the importance of family, it was 
procreation was absolutely necessary. It's been estimated that every mother in the Roman world and all women married, almost every single woman we know of, had to have six children just for zero population growth. And this was because infant mortality, child mortality was horrendous. Gastrointestinal diseases were rampant. And I have some facts and figures here. One in every three births, born children died in their first year of life. One in every children born died before they reached 10 years old. And it was, a, life was very brutal and short. We also find, even back in the Republic, um, that there is no evidence for family limitation, that is for husbands and wives consciously to try to limit the size of their families. Most women wed about the age of 17 to husbands 10 years older than them, and they had children. And these cultural norms were re-emphasized by Augustus's social legislation, which I'll come back to. So legislation at the very foundation of what we think of, of as the Roman Empire. So I'm speaking about family, and then I would ask the question of which Roman family? Of course, there's been some brilliant um, and insightful work on familial the family history, social history of the Roman world. And um, here I would just say, which Roman family is it, as we see on the left, which is a frieze from the Arapacus in Rome from 13 BCE, that shows us the family of Augustus, as far as we can tell. And this is the kind of aristocratic, multi-branched gens of many ages and status that was under a, pot, a father's patria potestas. This kind of family, and uh, Richard brought it up when he was speaking about Pompey and Caesar and then Octavian and then Augustus, was conspicuous in Republican politics and it also was key to the Republic's fall. Or are we speaking about the more nuclear and humble family of two, maximum three generations? This is a grouping that is much more prominent in funerary images, like the one I just showed from the North Carolina Museum of Art now, and, um, in, and from inscriptions from the late Republic and Empire. And I show another image of this family tomb over on the right. This comes from Rome, the end of the first century BC. CE, beginning of the first century CE, and you see moving from the left, a mother, a young child, the father, and a teenage daughter. And I always used to wonder, how could it be that teenage daughter and the young child, well, it's probably now, I think, well, it must be because of the infant mortality. In any case, both types of families availed themselves of Roman law and particularly Roman law that guaranteed property rights and the uh, right of testation, the right to deal with your land, which Richard brought out the importance of, to deal with your land as you want it. Now, um, this was important in the Republic and it continued in, important in the empire, but I think that, that family becomes even more prominent in the Roman Empire. And this is for a couple of reasons, I, uh, for many reasons, I list only a few here. One is for the, is Augustus himself, very pronatalist, who um, wanted people to have, went into the Senate and spoke about how everyone should have many children. And there is the so-called Augustan social legislation, laws that encouraged marriage, discouraged divorce, discouraged um, sleeping around, we might call it. And this is the first time that laws go into these social contracts. Before that, it was up to people to, to, for the fathers of, of families to deal with their families as they saw, foot, as they saw fit. Another change is the evolution of the dynastic imperial court itself, and especially the creation of what is called the Domus Divina, or the divine imperial family, 
already by the time of Tiberius, the second emperor. And here I show us the grand cameo of France, which of course every bit of it is somewhat controversial, but which seems to show in the second register, um, Tiberius who's holding the big scepter. And above him you see Augustus who's holding the scepter and going up into the sky as he's been apotheosized. And it gives us some sense I picked this because it gives us some sense of the awe that surrounded the imperial family, and this continues throughout the empire. And another change that I would point out here is the development of imperial cult that included women as objects of cult as well as men. And by 235 CE, we know that there had been 14 imperial women, that is to say women who were the wives or the sisters or the mothers or the daughters of the emperor who had been declared deified at their death. And that compares to 19 divi, to 19 imperial men, which is pretty remarkable. The imperial cult also included women in the municipalities as personnel. They were the ones who undertook the cult for, for deified imperial women. And so there were numerous local celebrations. In those celebrations, there could be handouts of sweets and foods and, um, and goods, and all of that uh, was a a very attractive thing. And we even hear, and this may seem just incidental, there are even some papyri from Egypt from the first century all going all the way to the end of the first century CE that attest marriage vows that were taken before statues of Livia, that is to say Augustus's wife. So there's, there's this model of the imperial family. The idea of lawful marriage was absolutely integral to the empire. And here what I show is part of a bronze diploma. It comes from Carnuntum right near Vienna, and it comes from 78 to 81 uh, CE. And it witnesses honorable discharge for auxiliary troops. These were men who were not Roman citizens when they joined Rome's forces and um, armed forces, but at their um, discharge, if they made it for all of their 25 years of service, they got a lot of perks. And among those perks were that they got full Roman citizenship along with their children and all of their posterity. And they also got full rights of marriage, including the right to distribute their property as they wished. They got that with their wives. And in the middle of the second century, particularly under the Antonines, under uh, Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius, family was especially promoted through coins, through statuary, through new customs. So family was something that was key to being Roman. And we can see this a little bit in um, some of the signs that we use for trying to think about Romanization, what constitutes living in the Roman Empire. And one of the signs is the, are these um, funerary reliefs. And, and epitaphs. And here I show you on the left, a late second century CE tombstone now in Budapest, where you see the wife, her husband with his beard and their grumpy little child in between them. And you also can see to the left of the wife, there's a little bit of another figure that has been broken off by the destruction of this piece. And so this was a more extended family. And on the right, you see a tombstone of a Palmyrene family. Um, and this tombstone is now in a private museum in Beirut. And it shows us the wife on the left and the husband on the right with what looks like a nice Roman imperial eagle embracing them and three children in the front. And this is a mark of 
Romanness. This is a mark of being Roman. And it's something you don't have to be elite, even though anyone who could afford a tombstone um, is somewhat elite. But this is something that everybody could aspire to within the, the valuation of family. Everybody within the Roman Empire could aspire to. This is my last slide, and I show it of the Severan Domina, which, in which we can see this is a tango, a round object that originally almost certainly was square. It's one of our very, very, very few remaining pieces of a kind of um, art, piece of art that was very common, which is painting. And most of that has disappeared in time. But this was done in Egypt, and it shows us the Severan imperial family. We see Julia Domna, the wife of Septimius Severus, to her left and to our right. And in front of them, two children, also decked out with their imperial crowns. Um, and uh, one of the children has been... I used to say a face, now we can say in the modern world, canceled. And um, the other one you can still see, and it's usually thought that these were Caracalla, whom you can still see, who took over power um, after his father, after killing his brother Geta and his uh, younger brother Geta. But I stop here just thinking about the difference of this image from the one we saw of the Arapacus, from the kind of extended aristocratic genealogies that there were in the Republic, to this more nuclear family, the valuation of the family as the bedrock of Rome and the seedbed of society. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. This was highly illuminating and uh, certainly gave us a lot of interesting information. You mentioned the value of family life, but what about divorces? What about people who didn't want to get married? What about gay people? How was that being dealt with, integrated, managed or not at all? Excellent, excellent question. So divorce is very common as far as we can tell. And it is, an, and, and it actually, divorce could be initiated by women just as much as by men. And um, marriage was a contract between two willing people. So one could say, I don't want it anymore, but particularly in the end of the Republic, if you were married to Sulla's uh, niece, you wouldn't want to divorce her because you could be on the wrong side. But divorce was common. What was important was to get married again and to have children, if at all possible. In terms of, and of course, the idea of family is something that is, it's almost laughable. It's a platitude. I know that when, during the Republican convention, um, there was quoted in the News and Observer somebody who said, I'm not going to go to a Black Lives Matter protest because they are Marxists and they are trying to tear down the traditional bedrock of our society, marriage. Well, we don't know. But when you think about what kinds of marriage, one of the things that has been so interesting to me at the second century where there's this exaltation of marriage, Hadrian had an open, long, multi-year affair with a young man whom he had in his entourage at the same time that he had his wife in his entourage. So, and at one point he said, well, my wife, she's such a, ooh, I would divorce her if, if I could, but he can't because he's the emperor. He has to have that family, even though they never had children. But he could have a, a gay, a same sex relationship as he wanted. So procreation is important and also property, um, being able to distribute property as you want. Mm -hmm. I hope thank that answered. Yeah, thank you. So that sounds as if the Romans were much more liberal than many of us today. Yeah. But let me ask you, let, let me ask you, you know, because of family life and the values of family life, what we also associate with the Roman Empire is Roman decadence. So how does that fit, uh, fit in with each other? 
Roman decadence, it's probably in the eye of the moralists who weren't invited to the party. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, every, the Romans love to decry decadence and they, Livy decries decadence. Um, they decry it from the get-go. So uh, I, 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 maybe my, my uh, co-speakers have a response to that. Um, That's a good idea. Let's ask Richard. Can you well, say something yeah, about sure. <laughs> Roman <laughs> decadence? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, but I think that, um, sure, I, decadence, of course, is uh, putting a bad spin on it. But if you want to put a good spin or, or a fun spin of it, it's, it's pushing the boat out, uh, uh, having a blowout, you know, uh, uh, fr Friday night and so on. And, um, and I think a lot of what uh, Tolly has said helps to explain that. that well, uh, uh, Ted as well, all of us, we, we're pushing the point that, that life is difficult, it's uncertain, it's very brutal. And no wonder there were people who made it, not necessarily always perhaps by means that we would approve of. They had it, they had energy, they wanted to flaunt it. Uh, they wanted to have a good time and, and they knew that, that life was going to be short. It's a case of, what do we say? I mean, to the cliche, carpe diem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and sure, there is the, there is the, there are the Roman moralists who say this isn't, this is not good, we don't approve of this. But I think we can understand it. Ed, would you agree with that? Or do you want to add to that? Unmute. I'm unmuting myself. I was asking Ted. <laughs> yes, I'm still unmuting. Am I mute? No, no you're fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would I mean, yes, there is obviously a, um, a discourse of decadence in which you, in every generation, everyone says everything's going to hell. And this is uh, probably um, started by Romulus himself and continues <laughs> Um, uh, to the last days of the Roman Empire. At the same time, there are periods, um, such as the, um, uh, the late Republic, when there is so much wealth um, flowing into Rome that um, if you look at it, you can say, well, actually, you know, they are kind of decadent. Um, when you have, when you have uh, for your, in your house 500 slaves, just to carry uh, uh, to uh, uh, to carry platters and things like that. Um, when you throw um, enormous and uh, enormous gigantic banquets and things like that. So um, and there are there are there are uh, there are characters like Lucullus who are particularly associated with living in this way. So on the one hand, yes, they do complain about it. On the other hand, yet yeah, on the other hand, there are actually periods where. They did get. They did actually do it. Oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The the reign yeah. of Nero, for example. Yeah, yeah, and I would I would actually add something here. I mean, when we think about decadence, we're thinking that you know we have access to TV and the the lifestyles of the rich and famous or something like this. I think one one way that I've tried to wrap my mind about this is to think about the discrepancies in wealth in the Roman world mm -hmm. that are just staggering. They are just staggering. And so um, there is a little bit of the people out in the provinces don't really know what's going on. Perhaps under Nero they do. But it's how do the people accept this? How are they accepting that they don't have enough to feed their family, whereas Lucullus in the Republic or Petronius has 500 matched slaves? Well, how does that, how, how does, how the, how can the empire continue when there is, when there are these glaring discrepancies? And of course, there are many, many things we didn't talk about. I mean, there's always this, the meritocracy dream that if you work hard, you're going to be able to move up in the ladder. There's, there's lots of, of small threads that help the empire to run forward. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that most people outside of the imperial cult and 
most people were probably, uh, they were working hard. They, Sounds they a bit like that. today, the deep polarization, the deep, these deep extremes between poverty and wealth. But that would bring me to my next question. Let me ask you a few questions before we then open it up to a question from the audience. And of course, the question always raised when we talk today about the Roman Empire is the comparison with a modern empire, particularly with the so-called American Empire or also other empires in more recent world history. The US classical experts, do you think that's all nonsense? That the Roman Empire was really something by itself, which cannot possibly be compared with something like the American empire? Or do you think there are useful lessons for us to learn in some way or other from what happened within, within and with the Roman empire? Uh, Ted, would you be able to help? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I find the term American empire uh, a peculiar one because you really can't be an empire unless you are consciously an empire. And um, the uh, foreign policy of the United States and, it, and, and the attitudes of its citizens very specifically re reject that. If you, if you lined up 100 Americans and said, um, you are members of the American or you are rulers of the American empire, they'd all say, you're, you're mad, you're kidding. We don't have an empire. Um, so, uh, so I do have a, I do have some problems just sort of te terminologically with that. But if you then say, okay, we're smart people, we can see the imperial qualities in what the Americans are doing, and we can call it an empire. Yes, of course there are lessons um, to um, uh, there. Are, of course, there are lessons to be learned uh, from uh, from the Romans, uh, including adhere to your treaties. Uh, including um, d do not let other powers get too powerful around you. Well, that's uh, what the current clash between China and the United States seems to be all about. That's a lesson from Rome. Indeed, and I think the current, I think, I think the, current um, the current clash between the United States and, and, and China uh, also, I mean, the Romans re regarded the world as rank in the sense that they were the, they were the power, the highest power, uh, and then there were other powers which were lesser than them, and they, uh, they, they referred to this, this ranking as their maestas, their majesty, their greaterness. Um, and I think that, um, oh, that, that the Chinese very often think in the same terms, uh, and we can not only learn about, about the United States um, from, uh, fr from these comparisons, but a lot of other states um, out there, Iran, for example, think in very Roman terms. And the more we know about the Romans, the more we can interpret how they behave. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mary. What, what is your opinion about that? I think you can always, um, I mean, there are no, no two historical periods or entities are ever alike, exactly alike. But there are many, many things that I find um, illuminating about thinking about the Roman Empire. I mean, one is that, and I didn't bring this out in my 15 or 17 minutes, one is that the Roman Empire was pretty much, in its heyday, was pretty much laissez-faire. You know, it didn't, it was, it was polytheistic. It was, you know, you could worship as you wanted. It, you didn't have that, as we were talking about um, marriage and sexuality. You didn't have to marry until Bill Augustus got in, but that was really only for the top echelon. He's not telling people on, in Pompeii that they have to marry. Um, so, and, and, you know, the fact that there is much more um, reliance on what we might think of well, I don't want to use the term propaganda, but on concepts, as uh, Ted has written about the, con the con honor, let's say, that, that you can gain honor and move up, of loyalty, of imperial virtues, of virgitism, of, of, of you um, justify your position at the top by helping those beneath you. And if you don't help them, then you shouldn't, you know, there's a very famous story about Hadrian where he is going someplace and a woman stops him and says, says, Emperor, 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 I need to 
talk to you. My son, my only support is being, is being drafted is, and I need help. And he said, I don't have time to you. And then she, she responds, well, then you don't have time to be emperor. I mean, things like that, I think any, any, ent any political entity, any polity that has as much power as, as America does, can think about these kinds of lessons and, and um, learn from them. Thank you. Richard, what do you think about lessons from the Roman Empire for today, for the so-called American Empire? Yeah, I should say, I don't know whether you noticed, but I got lost or something went wrong. I, mean, I, I didn't notice. I, uh, <laughs> I've missed some uh, precious gems by Ted and by, by Tolly. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So if I repeat what they said, um, forgive me. Um, well, first, I would like to say, Klaus, that uh, in res obviously responding to the way you put the question, I, I think it would be terrible to say, no, Rome is off in a separate box and you shouldn't compare it to other empires. And of course, that's ridiculous that, that we're fully entitled to take any trend, period, figure, whatever in history and compare with another. How fruitful that's going to be may vary, of course, but it's worth a try. Um, I Perhaps it's a little harder to compare the Roman Empire with a modern one, as Ted has said, you know, quite well, what is the American Empire? And also so many circumstances and expectations are different. That's not to say we shouldn't try it, but what certainly, I mean, what I will say is what I have found more fruitful, more instructive, more striking is to make comparisons with other pre-modern empires. Yeah. And I had the privilege uh, a few years ago, and unfortunately, it, for all kinds of reasons, it could only happen once. I, I wish we have had, would have had the chance to do it again, but, or, or even with a different combination. But I co-taught a course with two colleagues, uh, you know very well, Klaus, in our department, uh, Lisa Lindsay, who's now our chair, who is a historian of Africa, uh, and Catherine Burns, who is a historian of Latin America. And uh, what we did was to compare uh, the Roman Empire, uh, the pre-modern empires of West Africa, particularly Mali, uh, and uh, the Inca Empire. And that was, that to me was fascinating and revealing. Now, of course, the Empire of Mali is of a rather different character from the Roman and the Inca. The Roman and the Inca, are, I think, are much more immediately comparable. And of those two, uh, the big thing that kept hitting me was the extent to which the Inca exploited their subjects. And they make the Romans look like a collection of just sleepy dozers uh, who just leave their subjects to live their lives as they wish without restrictions, uh, uh, without putting them to work, uh, uh, and think, uh, uh, gaining from that, that really hit me. Yeah, I think what most people are concerned about when they think in terms of the Roman and the American Empire or American world power, whatever you want to call it, you know, the Roman Empire declined and fell and never rose again. Can something like that also happen to the United States world power? Well, hey, well, da, 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 da. Uh, be careful what you say, if I may stick up for the Romans for a Absolutely, moment. Absolutely, please. You glibly say the Romans declined and fell. Whoops. What Ted, I'm not finding fault with Ted, but what Ted didn't go on to say was, yes, the West was abandoned, right. but the more cohesive, the more wealthy East of the Empire was kept and it remained, okay, it did decline, but its full decline took a mere millennium. Uh, and uh, when the final emperor, who consider, he considered himself the emperor of the Romans, 
when Constantinople finally fell in 1453. So this is one thing to bear in mind that if we're talking about longevity, uh, whoa, I think we need to at least take some account of that millennium. Uh, uh, and yeah. the other thing that uh, we should surely bear, you know, you say, well, the Roman Empire's dead and gone. Whoops, uh, look around and think about the languages uh, that people speak globally today. Uh, think of uh, the expansion of Spanish language speaking. And if I can be a bit blunt for a moment, uh, 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 what is Spanish but, but a version of Latin? Uh, think of all the, the Romance languages. Think of, and again, I'm amazed this hasn't come up. I'm sure there are audience members bursting to ask this question. So I'll ask it uh, because it's amazing <laughs> this hasn't been mentioned yet. What about the Christian church? What about Christianity? What difference did Christianity make? Now, uh, people may read the Roman Catholic Church today in different ways, but many would say that that church is alive and well, and uh, that is uh, it's astonishingly Roman. Yes, and it's even expanding into China, as we heard yeah. recently. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, thank you very much for raising all these uh, questions. So, you know, when we think about the decline or fall of the uh, Roman Empire within a thousand years or something, then we can expect to see the last American president to step down in another thousand years. Perhaps. Who knows? But let me open it up to questions from the audience. And can I ask Pete and Brittany to get involved? And perhaps, uh, Pete, if you would ask the first question from uh, an audience member, please. Absolutely. I have to say that Mr. Talbert had a great degree of foresight. First question we have is from David Litt. How did Constantine's acceptance of Christianity affect the empire's stability or, or, or alternatively, the empire's ability to deal with external? threats. Well, are you going to say which speaker should tackle that first? If you don't, I'm going to encourage Professor London to... Okay, in. okay, let's go with uh, Ted London. All right, sorry, I thought it was directed at, at Richard. But in any event, I mean, the answer is pr in practice almost none. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the astonishing thing about the success of Christianity is how little impact it seems to have on the processes of administration, war making, law, things like that. Um, it goes, it, it runs in a parallel, uh, it runs in, along a parallel route. It's of, of course of immense historical importance, um, but it's not of tremendous historical importance for the sort of um, uh, uh, um, bridges and taxes history um, of the empire. And I would add also that um, it is, of course, it's been thought that the, uh, that the advent of Christianity makes a huge difference in terms of family structure and family life. It's not immediate. It's certainly not immediate. Uh, the kinds of, of strictures that are passed don't happen for an, almost another century. So it's, it takes time. Okay, thank yeah, you. I would like to give a slightly more, I'm not trying to deny what either of my colleagues have, have said, but I'd like to give a slightly more favorable answer to the question, actually. I think that uh, and what strikes me is, uh, and some people may not like it when I say this, but I, I think it's the case that Constantine adopts, he goes for Christianity, for very Roman reasons. Romans worshipped gods because they thought that gods could influence uh, things that happen in your life which you can't control. If you establish the right relationship with the gods, then they will see you right. They will give you victory. Uh, and as Ted Lendon has said, quite rightly, this is at a time when the Romans are in a tough spot. They're, they're facing many challenges. And Constantine's looking round for all the support, the backing he can get. Uh, and he's, uh, uh, he, he gives the Christian gods, a, the, the Christian god, a, a go. Uh, he gives it a try. 
Uh, and much to his surprise, it works. He prays to the Christian God before the Battle of the Bilvian Bridge, and surprise, he wins, and he keeps on winning these battles. Uh, and to that extent, I think that, that Christianity, the Christian belief, does give a further boost. And it also means that once emperors go fully Christian, and Constantine had been very careful about that to begin with, but once emperors go fully Christian, then uh, you've got a construction boom. Because, okay, you're not building circuses, uh, amphitheaters, uh, uh, that sort of thing anymore, but now you're building churches. Uh, that is uh, work for people. That's creativity for artists, architects, and so on. You've got all that. And Christianity does also offer, because it has a different view of the world uh, and society, it offers uh, uh, categories of society, uh, um, opportunities which before, a visibility which they hadn't had. And, and Tolly will allow me to say, particularly women. And Klaus, you asked, uh, perhaps rather a throwaway line, but a while back you asked, well, under the Romans, what about women who didn't want to get married? Well, there really isn't uh, a respected place for them in uh, traditional Roman society. But as you know, in Christianity, there is. Thank so you. I think, I think Christianity does make some difference. Okay, thanks very much. Brittany, your next question, please. So our next question is from Liz Burton in Melbourne. She thanks you all for your excellent and incisive talks and asks, with regard to the fall of the Roman Empire in the late fourth century, to what extent was there a consciousness in the period leading to the fall of identifying the vulnerabilities and what attempts were made to address them, if any? To Is that Melbourne in Australia? I believe so. That's very good. I'm very pleased that we have uh, viewers uh, from Australia joining us tonight. Thank you. And this is to whomever feels um, they would like to answer it. Well, Richard, you trapped us the last time by making us speak first and then disagreeing. So why don't we make you speak first this time? He's, he's, he's playing dumb. <laughs> and maybe, Mary, you should address that. Yeah, maybe you should have a go, Tolly, yeah. yes. What? So uh, the question is about, give, me, give it to me again, because I was thinking this was for Ted. So... Of, of course. So in regards to the fall of the Roman Empire, was there any attempt to address the vulnerabilities if they were identified? Did people recognize that this fall was imminent? And if so, what were they doing to try to stop that? Well, um, as, as was brought out earlier, I mean, there, there was a restructuring of the army. There was also the recognition that manpower was very, very weak. And so there was the acceptance of different groups of people to fight on Rome's side. Um, there had even been in the third century, the recognition that Rome didn't have the apparatus to, uh, to uh, be able to govern the areas that had long, long been under its control, such as Gaul, France. So um, a lot of the strong men things, such as the establishment of the Tetrarchy in the end of the third century that we already heard about with Diocletian, that Ted brought up, and also the, the reestablishment of a kind of monarchical um, rule through Constantine and his followers were some of the many attempts to, to shore up the, the corners of the world. There were parts of the Roman world that were just given away, even in the third century, um, that uh, the area of Dacia that was uh, pointed out earlier by uh, Professor Talbert, by Richard Talbert, in the area of modern Romania, which had very wealthy gold and silver mines and lead mines, that had been just abandoned because the Romans couldn't, couldn't take care of it. But thank you. And I think that, I think also it's, if I'm understanding the question right, the question is implying that the fall is something sudden, but, yeah. and as Tolly has just said, yeah, in some instances that's true, but the regional experience varies enormously 
And, uh, and I think also fall is a very, it's far too dramatic a term because when Roman headquarters disengages, that doesn't necessarily mean that all Roman influence is gone. Now, that, it, that might be true. It, this is all a bit hazy. And of course, the place is terribly remote. Pardon my saying it. But in Britain, you know, far away in Britain, across the ocean and so on, when the Romans disengage there, it does look uh, as if things Roman, Roman ways of doing things don't survive very long or very well. But if you compare the situation in Spain, where uh, the Visigoths come in, the Visigoths, they want help. They're not just a collection of destructive bozos. Uh, they want a functioning society. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, they keep Roman law. They adapt it, but they keep it. Uh, uh, they want uh, people who've had an, a Roman education to lend a hand, to be part of the administration. Ditto in Italy. That, that the Romans may disengage, uh, but a lot of the way things are done, the way Italy is ruled, remains extremely Roman, uh, similarly in Gaul. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, it, isn't, it isn't sort of black, white. It isn't, you can't sort of flip it and one moment you've got Romans and the next moment blah, everything Roman is gone. It, sure. It's not like that. No, thanks very much. We have plenty of questions to ask you. Uh, uh, who's the next one? Peter, thank you. Yes, we have a question from Professor Abe Allen from Sand Hills Community College in Whispering Pines, North Carolina. He asks, Rome overlapped with both China and Egypt. China and Egypt both experienced periods where their political unity collapsed, but they both were able to reunify. Why was Rome unable to do so? Ted, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I'm, I, I think that um, they, they also, of course, um, uh, experienced periods of invasion. Um, the, uh, the crucial thing is not to have the invasion happen at the same time as the political disunity. Um, and if you do have the invasion happen at the same time as the political disunity, uh, you tend not to, you, well, you tend not to just, or you, you get into a really very bad situation like the Romans got in the third century or you don't recover at all as the, as the, West got, as the Western Empire got into in the, uh, in the beginning of the fifth century. Um, so it's just, it's the, um, the other thing is that China particularly, which I know a little bit more about, it was a much more heavily governed um, place. And it, 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 it simply had a lot more stick to um, uh, than than, um, uh, than, than, than the Romans did uh, in the sense that um, it had more officials, uh, it, it, everything, was, everything was sort of more heavily organized. Um, the Romans kind of did, even in the fourth century, do things on a shoestring. Um, the Chinese are much, more, are, are, are much more efficient and organized about that sort of thing. Um, and therefore they can put things together better when they have problems than the Romans can. Thank you. It reminds me when the empire was, you know, in full flow, was there a kind of nostalgia for the Republic? Was there an idea that the Republic was more democratic in inverted commas, fairer to everyone or just the opposite? There definitely was nostalgia, I, I would say, for the Republic, particularly with some of, I mean, Tacitus, who was the great uh, Roman historian writing at the end of the and of the first century, beginning of the second century, is filled with what I think is an unreasonable nostalgia for the, the Republic. Um, and, you know, how it was much more lib liberated and, and liberating for those who wanted to engage in government. And when they engaged, they had really meaty things to think about and to discuss. I mean, it's not at all the Republic, as, as uh, Richard brought out, though. The Republic, people, there weren't that many people who were actually participating. It was a very limited democracy. And 
and, and that's controversial. Some people, have, Fergus Miller said it's more of, of a democratic system, but the most democratic it was, was through riots, I think. I would say having the people's voice heard. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, maybe. No, not. And this, hey, I mean, this nostalgia of Tacitus is, which you're quite right. Uh, uh, he oozes it, but it's so faux uh, because at the same time, this is a guy who is a first-generation senator. Uh, he's he's been given his chance by the empire, and I would have thought somebody from his kind of background and where he came from, his chances of becoming a senator during the Republic were, would have been very slim indeed. Um, and also Joe Blow on the top of the Roman omnibus, he doesn't want the Republic to come back. Uh, his vote is not worth very much, and he's got to take off work uh, to go along uh, and participate in voting. And, and, and the way it we won't get into this, please, but uh, the way in which Roman voting is organized, when he turns up at dawn, he won't necessarily know even whether his vote will be wanted during the day. So he may have to loaf around for ages and then go home without having even been able to cast his vote. He's much more concerned uh, that he has a ruler, a government that cares. Uh, and of course, the Republic didn't even have a government. Uh, and when Augustus comes along. Hey, uh, he not only wants to make the trains run on time, but uh, he wants to provide fresh water. He builds aqueducts. Uh, he makes sure that grain supply is functioning. We're not all going to starve this winter. Uh, to Joe Blow, that is much more valuable than, I mean, I, I, you'd agree, I'm sure, Tolly, but I mean, the, the, than the Republic ever was. Thank you very much. Let's let us move on, Brittany. Can you ask the next question? Yes. This next question is for Dr. Boatwright. Christina Pastora Valverde asks, why were gastrointestinal diseases so rampant during the Roman times? Was it because of the diet or was it due more to genetics? Ah, uh, it was really because of the water. The water, even though there was, uh, the aqueducts came to Rome and that was one of the great achievements of the Romans. Um, but the, there was no refrigeration. There was, uh, there was no understanding of any kind of bacteria, much less viruses. Um, and, uh, and it was just, the water was foul. People would drink water from the Tiber River, which uh, when I first was in Rome in the 70s, if you fell into the Tiber River, you had to go to the hospital and get, and get kind of cleaned up. And so, um, so it really was the water that was uh, to the problem. Is that, would you, wouldn't you agree, my co speaker? Yeah, plus, yes. well, and if you're in Rome, plus malaria. Yeah, uh, and malaria. Rome is malarial. It, yeah. Rome itself uh, uh, is, and until, you know, until the 1940s, uh, Rome. Rome was uh, uh, um, malarial, and when uh, and and when in the late night, I think it's just after World War II, uh, the uh, the Comune of Rome uh, uh, pays a call. I think it's the Duke of Aosta's family uh, who owned a huge tract of land down by the coast of the Mediterranean, just down from Rome, down the Tiber, and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in selling us a hunk of this land? According to the, at least according to the, the story on the street, I mean, the Duke scratched his head and said, what the heck do you want this for? This is absolutely useless. Uh, it's pretty much a malarial swamp. Uh, it's, you know, if you tog upright, it's good for some hunting. But, but what else? What earth do you want to do with this? Oh, and the community said, well, we're planning to build an airport there. Uh, well, you know, in a post-penicillin era, you, you could get away with doing that. You could drain the swamp. Uh, but much of Rome itself was like that. And so, of course, the death rate was, uh, uh, Rome was, Rome was a big allure for people to move there, and then it killed them. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Pete? We have a question from Michael Williams. How should we compare national sentiments of political moral decline of the present day with that of Rome in the mid to late first century BC? Um, and we can direct this question to Mr. Lenden. Um... <clears throat> 
all societies all seem to think that they're always in decline. Um, uh, there don't seem to be a lot of exceptions to that basic fact. Uh, and um, the, um, the Romans particularly uh, had a very strong uh, discourse of decline, which they get quite early and they keep, um, and, they, and, and, and is extremely powerful with them. Um, they are a very gloomy folk about themselves. And the first things, you know, when they pop into history, the first things they're practically saying about themselves is, oh, it's terrible. Aren't we, the, aren't we so much worse than we used to be in the old days? Um, and <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> I do not, I mean, leaving current politics aside, it has always struck me that the United States, and I do not speak here as an American because I'm not, I'm a Canadian, um, the Americans are an exceptionally optimistic people um, and do not in general think that their society is in decline. Um, but if you lined up, um, if you lined up a hundred Americans and said, do you think things are likely in the next 50 years to get better or worse? 99% um, of Romans would say worse, and at least 60% um, of Americans would say better. Yeah. Can, can I just ask you, to, talking about um, a comparison with modern times, one of the problems today, or one of the issues which people believe, or many people believe are problematic, is ethnic minorities, migration and immigration, Was that, and citizenship, and how to get or not to get uh, uh, citizenship. What was the situation like in the Roman Empire? Were people quite ready to give out their citizenship? Were they quite ready to integrate so-called ethnic minorities and foreigners? Or was there also a lot of uh, resistance among many people? Hmm. That's the, that is a big question. I mean, one could see that the in the end of the, and uh, Richard spoke about this a little bit um, when he was doing his overview. So, in the Republic and during the Rome's Republican wars were phenomenally successful because of manpower. And partly they were successful because they got more than half of their manpower from their allies. This is to totally simplified, but their allies were supposed to get an equal share of the spoils, et cetera, et cetera. And it became very clear during the second century BC that this wasn't happening. And, um, and so finally there was a war, the so-called social war in the early part of the first century BCE where the allies said, you know, hell, we're not, we're not fighting. And in fact, all of, of Roman history is, is riddled with um, stories of those who do not have access to privilege rebelling or moving to get that privilege. And then the Romans say, oh yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I'm gonna give it to you because we need the manpower. Um, so, so they're reluctant to uh, give out citizenship. On the other hand, they actually, I think, give out citizenship pretty liberally. And they do it through manumission of slaves. They do it through, grants in the empire where the emperor one way he shows what a decent guy he is is to give a community citizenship and they also through these uh, these the honorable discharges that i was speaking of that i showed but i may you all jump in Richard. well i would say two things uh Klaus. one one, let's be, I, you know, I can't give a total uh, answer to the question because it's a very big one. Uh, but two things let's get clear. One is Romans don't have a hang up over skin color. Yeah. Uh, that's, that is not, they, they don't, and, and very noticeable on the, uh, uh, the, the, the image that, that Tolly Boatwright showed, you notice how dark uh, Septimius Severus, because he was from North Africa, uh, how he is shown as dark skinned. But that's, that's not a strike against him at all. That, that doesn't matter. The other thing I think is just to take up on one uh, detail, but a very important detail that Tolly mentioned, and that is this 
incredible Roman habit, which goes way back and uh, we can't, we don't have the details of how it emerges, but it must be to do with recruiting manpower to the society. Uh, Romans did something which Greeks were horrified by. They thought this was crazy, unbelievable. Uh, the Roman convention, the, the Roman rule was that slaves, of course, are private property. But if you are a Roman owner of a slave and you choose to free that slave, to give them their freedom, to manumit them, as it's called, and that's a private decision. When you do that, I'm simplifying, but, but effectively, when you do that, as a Roman owner, a Roman citizen owner, the slave gets not only freedom, but also Roman citizenship. Uh, and that is something that is a much greater privilege than most Roman provincials, people in the provinces, ever got. And not surprisingly, there are stories, uh, we don't quite know how true they are, but there are stories of non-Romans who voluntarily enslaved themselves to Roman owners in the hope that they could get their freedom and thereby have Roman citizenship, which they valued very highly. Mm -hmm. So Rome is, Rome is uh, in many respects, uh, and, uh, continues to be open, maybe too big a word, but, it, but it's tending to openness uh, and it wants to grow its numbers. Thank you very much. Brittany, maybe the next question for Ted, if you have one. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I caught, my, I caught it. <laughs> so this question is asked by David Henke, David Henk. And he asks, what is the impact of pandemic on empire? Um, the impact, this is, that's an excellent question. Uh, there are, particularly um, during the, um, uh, during the, um, uh, the middle of the second century AD, there is in fact a great plague that runs through the Roman empire. Uh, and um, in, in some people's eyes, weakens it very badly. There's another great plague in the period of Justinian, that's in the 500s uh, AD, um, which also similarly weakens it um, uh, very considerably. Um, <clears throat> one has to take, um, one has to remember what Tolley told us, however, which is that what we call pandemic, the Romans would call normal summer. <laughs> um, uh, that is, um, people die in the Roman Empire all the time, and particularly children die in the Roman Empire all the time, uh, at, at a rate which we would find absolutely intolerable. Um, they don't notice unless you get a, a, a plague which is actually killing 20 or 30 percent of the population. Then they notice, and then, and then they write it down. But what we are currently going through no Roman would have regarded as any as anything other than a bad summer in Rome. No, no, no. No, and the other thing I think we can add is a huge contrast between the Republic and the Empire is the horrendous casualties in war yeah. during the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, not only numbers of men who are drafted into the army uh, in any one year, but but the death rate, the casualty level, uh, this is something which, uh, well, I, when I taught courses, I don't have to anymore, having just retired, but... but uh, uh, Stop gloating! As, as I used to say, uh, uh, is this fair? I don't know. Klaus, you could help with this maybe, but in, in modern warfare, certainly as far as Westerners are concerned, I think one would have to go to the experience of Russia, perhaps in both world wars uh, in the 20th century, to get some com something reasonably comparable to the loss of life uh, during warfare. And this, of course, was not just for limited periods for Rome and the Republic, because war was a way of life for the Roman Republic. And so th this sort of casualty level is relentless. And that was tolerated, or there was no choice. Yeah. 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 Thank you, uh, Pete. Would you like to ask the next question? Yes, I uh, will direct this question to Mary Boatwright. 
When comparing the Roman Empire with the Ottoman Empire, the British, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and other empires, uh, which of the following do you think was the best run and left lasting benefits? And oh that's goodness. the Ottoman, British, Spanish, and Portuguese. Oh my goodness, this is way out of my, uh, my brain wave. I, I've always been saying to my children that who are adults, Oh, for my eighth decade, I'm going to learn about the Ottoman Empire. So, <laughs> but I ain't there yet. Um, I think I would probably have to, I have to turn to my esteemed colleagues uh, to answer that question. I guess I would just say that it's hard. You would have to consider very um, carefully what criteria you were using for for the best run i mean is it is it as richard said earlier about the inca empire is it that you can get more stuff out of your people or is it that more people are happy or whatever but i turn to my colleagues well i'll say two things one is that uh if if you're a subject of the empire and you just want to go on living your life, talking your, you know, speaking your own language, pursuing your own religion, your own culture and so on, just be left alone pretty much for a lot of the Roman period. That's a, that's an option that Rome offers you. Ted's right that that's not true in the early centuries when Romans are building the empire, but say from Augustus's time for the next couple of centuries, where it is more uh, stable uh, uh, and recovered, that is true. So to that extent, you know, Rome is, Rome doesn't do so badly. The other thing is, this is a plug for a book, I think it's going to be more than one volume, which I don't quite know where it's got to, but I understand it's supposed to be coming out soon. And that is something Peter Bang in Copenhagen and others have put together, uh, which is some fantastic compendium of something like 75 empires across <laughs> the world. It's a kind of handbook encyclopedia. And I can't wait for that because I'm like Tolly, you know, I, I don't remember about all these other empires mm -hmm. and I'd love to learn uh, and get get the basics, um, and it's apparently going to do it. And Oxford, is supposed, Oxford University Press, do you know about this, Ted? Or, uh... No, no, I just, I have nothing to add. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I just follow up on that? Um, uh, how did the empire, uh, the emperor, uh, actually uh, relate to other empires, to other, other mm -hmm. states, uh, in the vicinity, which were not uh, uh, subservient to Rome, which were not dependent on Rome, which were, as we would say today, sovereign uh, nations, sovereign states. As we know from China, the Chinese emperor always saw himself as the center of the world and everyone was kind of less superior than he was. How was that, uh, or was, that a, uh, was there a similar case with the Ro Roman empire? Or was it totally different? Well, you've only, he's only got one. He's only, he's only got one who he can relate to uh, until much later on. The Byzantine Empire is a bit different, but, yeah. but in, in the sort of heyday of the Roman Empire uh, and coming on to Diocletian and Constantine, there is only one, and that is the Parthian or Persian King of Kings. And uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, a, a, man, a professor in, I think he's in Minnesota, uh, Matthew Canapa, uh, The Two Eyes of the Earth. And of course, both uh, Rome uh, and the Persian or later Sasanian Empire, uh, each regards itself as a world empire with uh, uh, Rome at the center uh, of the Roman Empire, or the center of the whole world, uh, Ctesiphon, likewise, for the Sasanians. And uh, these two, uh, they don't meet, but they write letters to each other, addressing each other as brother. Mm -hmm. uh, because, okay, they're enemies, but, you know, it's a bit like, isn't it, well, I have to be careful here, but, you know, isn't it a bit like uh, um, whichever Russian president it is and Khrushchev or something uh, actually meeting in Moscow at the right high level? And it's only at that level that, you know, you can get the sense, well, I mean, you know, you may be my enemy and your whole society has a different philosophy, but, but you know what it's like up here in this elevated, impossible position. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Nixon and Khrushchev or something, or, you know, and Nixon and Mao, or, we're brothers. We are at that level. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? Does that make any sense? Yeah, Khrushchev. There is no other person for the Roman emperor to hobnob with on that level, is there? No, indeed not. And, I mean, there are moments when they decide to insult each other yeah. and refer to each other as inferiors. Yeah, um, and this tends to produce war. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We have a, a few minutes uh, left, and perhaps if the panelists ha- are not totally exhausted already, perhaps we have a few questions we can bring in. Brittany, would you ask another question? Of course. This is to whomever wants to take it up from Roger Goldstein. We've talked a lot about war and empire building, but Roger asks, how was civil peace and order maintained at the local level, level within the empire? Mm-hmm. Um, Tolly already uh, um, uh, addressed that question, which is that the d- empire is divided among some 2,000 cities, uh, and almost all the territory of the empire is divided among those cities. There are some areas which are so, um, uh, where there are so few people that they are not uh, associated with the city, but, but, but most of it is associated with the city. And each city is self-governing and is expected to keep the peace within its own district. Um, what normally happens is that there is a committee, um, uh, in, the, in Latin it's called the Curia, and in Greece it's called the Boule, uh, a committee of the richest men in the town, and they rotate between them being chief of police, essentially. Um, and um, uh, th- then there are a few hired, um, uh, there are a few hired soldiers, um, sort of pe- uh, or p- kind of policemen who are under the command of that person. Um, but uh, the result is that um, the peace is kept very well within the cities. But the instant you actually leave the walls of a city, things could be pretty scary in the Roman Empire. There is, ba- there is always banditry. Uh, and uh, simply because the, um, uh, the Romans are satisfied with this very basic method of keeping the peace. There are very few Roman soldiers themselves in the interior provinces. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, well, and also there isn't, there typically, yeah, there isn't much of a police force either because it's all, as Ted has said, it's all very locally based. And in each, you know, in each city, it's it's the leading wealthy landowning families, the good old boys. They know their guy. They know their men. They know their people, and uh, they mostly know where the trouble is or is likely to come from. And they're keeping their finger on that because it's very much in their interests. Uh, to keep the city peaceful, because if they don't, then the Roman authorities may be alerted, and they don't want that, because they don't want the, the Roman authorities coming to look at how they're keeping or not keeping the books and, and looking after things. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the ways they also do it, of course, to keep the population sweet is that they entertain them, just like the emperor at Rome puts on shows and entertainments and there's some handouts and festivals. That's noblesse oblige. That's what the, the local elite are doing on a local level. And that, that keeps the folks in, that's one of the things that helps to keep the folks in line. Maybe that is what we need today as well. Let's ask the <laughs> governor of North Carolina to bring out more <laughs> entertainment for us. Pete, would you ask another question? Yes, we have a question from David Litt. Did Augustus or others impose Latin as a common language in the Roman Empire? And this is directed to whoever wants to answer. No, no. I mean, Romans didn't, Romans didn't do that kind of thing. If you, if you wanted to join the army, uh, uh, you'd have to look. But, but I mean, that, that then if you were a non-Roman and, and the army wanted you, uh, then there, were, there were probably were sort of Latin 101 classes. Uh, and certainly the sergeant or the centurion would knock some into you pretty quick. Uh, and the other boyos would too. Um, but no, I mean, this is one of the things. I mean, the Romans did not... Uh, uh, impose culturally 
uh, uh, they didn't make you learn English or play cricket or uh, 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 this kind of thing, that, that uh, if you wanted to go on doing your own thing, as long as you were loyal, kept the peace, paid your taxes, Rome didn't want to bother otherwise. Yeah. And of course, if you wanted to, you could wander all over the place. And, and one of the amazing things is during the first two centuries AD, what turned out to be this pesky, rather uh, uh, alternative, uh, uh, potentially disruptive religion, Christianity, this, this missionizing religion spread all over the place because the pesky lot of missionaries wandered around all the roads, they sailed over the Mediterranean, used all the facilities which Rome provided free, and the Romans weren't noticing or caring. That sounds like a great life. Ted, you, did you want to come in? Or? No, I just, I, that's, abs that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. If, you, if you, for example, find that you are involved in a court case, you might be motivated to learn Latin. Yeah. And to, as what tends to happen is you, you, uh, as, as families get more important, uh, the the, the, their command of Latin improves because they have business to be done in Latin. But no, they, the Romans not only never made anyone learn Latin, they always regarded it as a rather contemptible that anyone should want to learn Latin because they should stick to their own languages. And, and one other thing I would add is that half of the empire spoke Greek mm -hmm. and um, used Greek for their official documents and for their town council meetings and whatever else it was in the Greek East. And so, and so you can have bilingual Roman, I mean, Latin and Greek, but you can also have, when Augustus sends something off to Cyrene, it will be in Greek. It's not in Latin. Thank you. And the Romans also, so to speak, the Romans reciprocate in the sense that they're not the least bit interested in learning foreign languages. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, the only foreign language, really, they can be, most of them can be bothered to learn uh, is Greek. But I mean, the, 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 the empire is a tower of Babel. Of, of languages. Uh, uh, he, you know, think of the East. I mean, Hebrew, Syriac, uh, and so on, Coptic later, uh, um, Demotic, at least in Egypt. Um, uh, and many of those languages, of course, are not, they're not written down. They, they don't have an alphabet and so on. Thank you very much. Shall we have two more questions and then we'll say goodnight? Brittany, do you want to ask a question? Mm. Sure. So the next question is from Kamathi Murray Rui. Professor Talbot remarked that the institution of the principles established by Augustus had remarkable longevity. Conversely, Diocletian's tetrarchy dissolved quite quickly. What factors caused the widely desperate durabilities of these two institutions? Was it marital conditions, governing structure, imperial, imperial egos, or something else? Timothy, are you the guy I taught a couple of years ago? Oh, I, I shouldn't ask that. Maybe that's <laughs> that's maybe off. That's that's maybe off topic. That's not allowed. But what are you saying? That Augustus's arrangements lasted a long time, and Diocletian's didn't? No, that's not fair. Uh, it's true. Some of the details, perhaps, of. Diocletian's arrangements didn't, the tetrarchy, the, what we call the tetrarchy, that's a modern term, where you had four emperors, Constantine didn't like that because he wanted to be so boss. That didn't, that didn't last. But, but the idea of having more than one emperor and what Ted Lendon talked about, uh, the, um, the, the reform, you know, the enlargement and the reforms of the army, uh, many of whom were now made cavalry too, uh, and bureaucracy and so on, this much tighter administrative hold, uh, the tax take going up, all that, no, I mean, all that survived. You could argue that much of that survived, whoa, right into and through the Byzantine period. So uh, the, the impact of the changes that Diocletian and Constantine made were enormously important and, and long lasting, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question will be asked by Pete. Yes, this is from DG Martin um from chapel hill 
And we touched on this earlier, but what about slaves and slavery? How did the institution work in the Roman Empire? Wow. That, I, and this is our tiny final question. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, there is, a, this is a very general answer. Um, there's a lot of discussion about slavery and how pervasive it was in all the parts of the empire or whether it was more in the big cities, um, what it was. It does seem to have been integral to the empire from beginning to the end. It was not abolished under Christian, under Christian empress, um, certainly not by Constantine. And, uh, and uh, so it was a part of the, of the Roman world and the Roman mentality. And um, a big question is where are the slaves coming from? Are, are they coming from, are they, Homeborn? Is it from uh, local reproduction? Are they are they war slaves as they were in the Republic? There are many many questions that are involved with slavery, but that's just a general response. I don't know. Maybe Ted, you want to add? I just guess what I would add is what is remarkable about Roman slavery is the rate of freeing slaves. Um, <clears throat> that Roman slavery is like chattel slavery in most societies where they, where they have chattel slavery, with the exception of the fact that it did not have a racial component and that you, that at least if you were a slave in a townhouse, you had every reason to suspect, to expect that you would be able to buy your own freedom. And frequently you could buy your own freedom quite early in life as in, in your thirties. Um, and so you have a huge number of freedmen wandering around um, uh, who have close connect, who remain members of their uh, former masters' households, um, but um, uh, uh, but are 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 are, are legally free. Um, and I mean, I believe I believe that old Brazil, for example, also had a had a system of manumission of this type. Um, but I think this is quite rare uh, in in the history of the world. This is the one thing that makes the Roman system of slavery uh, uh, stand out most most strikingly. Yeah, the other thing the other thing to add surely is, and this is particularly important if uh, anybody has slavery in the American South in mind, is that Roman slavery, or indeed Greek too, is not restrictive in terms of occupation. And the the uh, to me, I, you know, I, I just I find it so hard to take this in. I'm just I'm absolutely unbelievable, intolerable that you have a whole class in society uh, who you are legally forbidden. Uh, to teach even to read and write. There is nothing like that. There's no such restriction in antiquity. And, um, and as Ted has said, some of, certainly there are slaves in uh, uh, urban rich people's households where the whole point is if they're smart, you give them training, uh, you make them accountants, you show them all that, uh, you develop their skills. Um, and okay, that's, that's exploitation, it's good for you, but if they earn their freedom, then that's something they can carry into their own uh, uh, freed life. Uh, and um, so uh, the notion that, that you know, slaves can have skills and use them uh, and those can be fostered, that's all part, part of Roman slavery. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, and thank you, of course, I would like to give you the opportunity to tell our viewers, and quite many are still left even after over two hours, so I'm very impressed you kept their attention, obviously. Why would you recommend to any of our viewers to go out tomorrow and buy a book on the Roman Empire and read it, of course, perhaps one of the books you have written yourself? What does that actually give to us, apart from historical knowledge about a period some 2,000 years ago or so, but what that, that, does that give to us and our lives today? What would, can we really learn in, uh, you know, at, at the bottom, at the substance-wise, uh, the fundamentals which would be important for reading a book on the Roman Empire? And you can uh, connect that perhaps with a few concluding words, if you like. Mary, can I start with you? I would just say, of course, 
I'm, I'm converted, but it's fascinating individuals. And the way that uh, Roman history was written by the Romans, by the ancients, is to provide lessons for us all, lessons to follow, lessons to avoid, and to give us moral ups, uh, understanding. But one of the things I find most interesting about Roman history is its, it's acknowledgement of how things usually never go correctly, that things fall apart and um, what you can learn from it. And as Polybius says, the Romans won so often because they utilize the knowledge gained in disaster. And to me, that seems a very valid and valuable thing to have. Indeed, thank you very much. Ted. Yeah, I mean, I, I would not, you know, send, you, send anyone out to get a, a book of Roman history in order to, uh, to learn sagacious things about their lives or anything of the sort. I love the Romans because the Romans are cool. Um, and the Romans are fascinating in themselves. Uh, and I think that if you go to buy a book about the Romans, you should go and buy a book about the Romans because you want to know about the Romans and you think that the Romans are cool and fascinating. Thank you very much. Richard, your conclusion. Well, if I may say so as another foreigner, uh, if you are an American, you definitely ought to learn something about Roman history and Roman ideas and think about uh, the ideas underpinning the American Republic. Uh, both political, you know, political, constitutional, legal, architectural, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, because an America, or let's not get into American exceptionalism, but uh, America is very special, uh, has a very special relationship with the Romans and Roman thinking. Very fundamental. There is that. There is also, I would certainly back up what my two colleagues have said, that uh, one of the huge, of course, any, you know, you should all kinds of periods of history and peoples you should study. I'm not, but you're asking me to make a plug for the Romans. So what I will say about them is that uh, one of the great uh, pleasures and advantages of uh, studying them is, as Tolly has said, that they, we happen, they happens to have survived miraculously a tremendous amount of what they wrote about themselves and their ideas, both fiction and non-fiction, not even all the non-fiction, by the way, you should believe, because uh, uh, they weren't necessarily interested in telling the truth. They were often spinning yarns or pushing them down the line. But that too, of course, is very good for your critical thinking. Uh, uh, and uh, this is very, very important and very special, not unique, but very special about the Romans. And I'm afraid, you know, if you compare that with other uh, great civilizations, I'm not trying to get at them, but if you compare that, say, with Hittites uh, or Egyptians uh, or Inca, there isn't, there just isn't that kind of record. And uh, the other great bonus, uh, uh, the great, and, and Tolly has illustrated this as she always does so brilliantly uh, this evening, is we have so much relating to Roman culture that's visible. Uh, objects of all kinds, from huge monuments uh, uh, to tiny little things, which she also showed us this evening. And, and that's, that's, again, not unique to Romans, but it's very special. Mm -hmm. And all this body of evidence, both written and material, is large and fascinating, but it's not overwhelming. Uh, uh, Klaus, if I may dare compare with the kind of period that you study, that if somebody wants to get a handle on all the written evidence uh, and the archives for World War II, good luck to you uh, uh, as one individual <laughs> in your lifetime. Uh, but if you want to do ancient Rome, you know, you really can in not so long, you can read all the stuff uh, that, that Tolly and Ted and I and others study for, for, for Rome. So, you know, you too can really engage very closely and comprehensively in a way which for many other civilizations, I think is hard. 
Thank you very much. And of course, if you go to Washington, D.C., you go to the Supreme Court, you go to the Houses of Congress, the Senate, and of course, one feels reminded of the Roman Empire and of the city of Rome and of many other things, as you rightly said. Thank you very much to our three excellent and brilliant panelists. That is Ted Talendon and Mary Boatwright and uh, Richard Talbot. Really has been a pleasure. It has been illuminating and very, very enlightening. That was for us a relatively unusual session because we normally deal with much more contemporary affairs. However, I think we learned from tonight that we should look back into history much more often and perhaps have a repeat performance, bringing in the Greeks, bringing in other empires and other civilizations and perhaps do something similar uh, in the future. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much for all our viewers who are still with us and quite a few are after over two and a half, two, excuse me, two and a half hours. Before I go, I just would like to mention that our next session is actually on October the 14th and that is very topical and very um, current. That is a session on the Iranian nuclear deal. Is it dead in the water or still alive and kicking? And we have four, uh, excellent, in, uh, four, four excellent experts, uh, including a former German ambassador who now runs a think tank on, not a think tank, an institution which deals with trading with Iran and all the difficulties. We have former American diplomats and, and experts and think tank people who all will tell us about whether or not it makes sense to still get involved in the Iranian nuclear deal or whether we should really be glad to have uh, withdrawn and gotten rid of it, as the Trump administration, of course, has done. That is on October 14, this time at 4 p.m. Thank you very much again for tonight, and I hope I'll see you again in two weeks' time on October the 14th about the Iranian nuclear deal. And thank you very much to Brittany and Pete, of course, for thank asking you. so many good questions on behalf of our viewers. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.